So I love multi-factor authentication. Um, it's arguably the most effective security control you can introduce, at least on a, on a technical side. Um, adding multi-factor path to production at Heroku was probably the best thing that our team did in my, in my time there and certainly saved our butts on a number of occasions. Um, ask me about that over beers later. Further, multi-factor auth is also becoming table stakes for companies providing internet services. This is a site, twofactorauth.org, where um, it kind of tracks which, which sites, which tools offer multi-factor authentication. There's a little button there that you can use to tweet at the companies and nag them about adding multi-factor authentication. So if you work at one of those companies and you've gotten one of those tweets, this talk is for you. Um, the problem is the landscape here is complicated. There are a lot of options. There are a lot of different tools. There are a lot of questions you have to answer. It's not that simple. And so what I hope to do today is um, give you kind of an overview of the options available, the questions to ask, the, the trade-offs between making different choices, and um, give you some suggestions about how to implement multi-factor authentication for your site or your application. So you'll notice I, I use the term multi-factor instead of what might be more common term two-factor. And, and the reason for this is I, I, want to, I want to get you to start thinking about authentication as something more complicated than just what happens when you log in. And keep in mind that it's not just about one factor or two factors or three factors. There, you have a lot of information when someone takes an action on, on your site. Um, you've got their password, you've got their IP address, you've got the, the user agent, are they mobile, are they on a, on a, a desktop browser, you know, the geolocation of that IP address, um, you know, uh, things like uh, uh, security challenges, Facebook does a cool thing, well, they'll, sh they'll show you, if they think you're being spoofed, they'll show you an image of someone in your network and say, who is this person? Presumably, you're the only one who can answer that, not an attacker. The point here is that we can start thinking about authentication as an action that we take any time we have a suspicion that the person taking this action may or may not be, be authorized to do so, and that this, this second factor isn't where better authentication stops, it's where it starts. Um, but in terms of the first implementation, if you're just getting started here, you're probably thinking about possession factors. These are, these are things you have, a phone, a hard token, something that you have physically, as opposed to you know, a password, which is something that you know, something that you memorize. Um, and so this is what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna talk about in the rest of this talk. I'm gonna give you an overview of what the various options for possession factors are. I'm gonna lay out some questions that I think you should ask when you're implementing multi-factor authentication. And then I'll give you my recommendations, what I think are the best practices for implementing MFA on your systems. So let's talk about possession factors. There are a lot of options. Uh, I think they break down roughly into three broad categories. There are out-of-band communication, text messages, emails, phone calls. The idea here is you are, when the user tries to log in, you then communicate back to the user out of some out-of-band band, pre-saved uh, mechanism, like an, like an SMS. Um, there are soft tokens. You may be familiar with this if you've used Google Authenticator or GitHub's two-factor auth or Dropbox or many, many of the sites. This might be the most common implementation, at least for public-facing uh, uh, web apps. Um, they're mostly mobile. There are desktop versions um, of those. And finally, hard tokens. These are actual physical devices, not like a phone that you already own, but some special purpose individual device like an RSA token, a YubiKey, or, a, um, or a, a, a smart card. So when you're choosing a factor, I can think of three main criteria that I would use to decide what's the right, what the right choice is. As security people, we tend to focus on risks exclusively, and, and we should think about them in this, in this case. Different choices have different, um, different vulnerabilities. Um, uh, SMS messages can be intercepted. Um, uh, soft tokens can be compromised by device malware. Um, physical tokens can be physically stolen. We should also ask questions like, if a possession factor is compromised, would we know that it happened, uh, or would that theft be silent. But I think even more important than thinking about just the risks, which will lead us to choose the most secure solution, 
I think we should also think a lot about the user experience because you can roll out the most robust multi-factor system you can think of, but if it's a pain in the butt to use, your users are gonna route around it. And especially if you are providing some sort of a public service, a, a banking website, a social network, you, wanna, you want this to be something that your users like, want to use. You want to convince them that they, that they need to use it rather than to route around it. And so user experience, I think when it comes to multi-factor auth, is arguably more important than purely thinking about the risks. And finally, cost is a factor, right? Like what's it gonna cost you as the provider to implement it and how much of that cost does, does the user have to bear? SMS messages are usually free for most users, but hard tokens are gonna to cost 20, 40, 60 bucks each. Is that a cost that your users are willing to bear? So, to compare these briefly, um, out-of-band communications, I think, are a good, uh, a, a good first step from a user interface point of view. Use is something that the user already has, like a mobile phone. They're probably already familiar with how SMS messages work. Um, it does bear some risks, right? Like it's a lot easier to compromise someone's phone or intercept an SMS message than it is to physically steal a hard token. Um, but it's free, um, it's fairly cheap for providers, and it uses something that users already have. Soft tokens, I think, probably ratchet the security level a little bit more. Um, you can still be compromised through device malware. For a while there was a malicious version of the Google Authenticator app in the, in the Android store um, that would send the multi-factor tokens somewhere else. It's a little scary. Um, but again, you know, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good here, right? Something is better than nothing. And soft tokens do have the advantage of being relatively familiar, at least to reasonably advanced users. I'll, I'll bet most people in the audience have Authy or Google Authenticator or something similar installed on their phones right now. And soft tokens tend to be really popular because they're free on both ends. The behind the scenes, they use a protocol called TOTP most of the time, uh, which has open source implementations in basically every language. And they're free to users. They, they are free apps and phones that they already have. So that big advantage there. Hard tokens probably have the highest level of security. They're fairly hard to compromise. Really, the only big risk I can think of is that most have some sort of a master key. Um, several years ago, the uh, RSA master key was compromised. And, that was incredibly costly to anyone who rolled them out because you have to, you know, you, rolling a credential when it's a physical device involves buying devices and shipping them out via UPS and all of that, that headache. Um, one of the big advantages from a user interface standpoint that hard tokens have is they enable more frequent authorizations. Um, you would like ideally to have users authenticate kind of anytime they do anything sensitive, but if that involves waiting for a text message, then typing a code off the phone into a, into a laptop, you're probably not gonna want to do that very often. Hopefully you have an idea of some of the trade-offs of the factors, and now you need to think about implementation. So there are a couple of questions that I think you should ask when you think about implementation. The first one is when to ask for a possession factor. Um, we normally think about two-factor auth as only happening upon login, and, and that's good if that's, if that's all you have time or bandwidth for. You know, fair enough, that's certainly better than just requiring a password. But a little bit better is to re-prompt for a, a new password or a new token when the user does some, something sensitive. It's gonna depend on your application. You know, a good example might be um, GitHub does this when you want to do things like add new users to an organization. It'll prompt you for a password if you haven't logged in recently. Um, think of this as kind of like pseudo mode, but for, for a web app. What I like about starting to prompt upon action is it gets, as a developer, it gets you thinking about authentication as something that happens um, repeatedly over the lifespan of the application, not something that happens just upon login. And you can start fairly simple, just you know, re-prompt once or twice um, and kind of ratchet that up over time as you get more sophisticated about understanding how risky a particular behavior is for, for your user or for your app. The best system where you really get super sophisticated is when, when you're not just prompting every time a user does action X, but based on some sort of analysis of, of behavioral factors. Uh, an example, um, Google does this. When I landed here in Paris and logged into Gmail, Google asked me to re-authenticate because it 
knew that the last time I checked Gmail was in the US and now I was in France and that's a little bit suspicious so why not make me log in again. And this is not actually as hard as it sounds. It really only requires capturing a bunch of that context, um, the IP address, the location, the user agent, and using and, and analyzing that behavior over time so that you can, you can have some sort of an, an idea, some sort of a heuristic about what might constitute a risky behavior. Location changes, frequency of, of authentication, um, multiple user agents within a small time window. Any of these might be something you could consider suspicious. The other difficult question is dealing with lost tokens. What happens if your user's cell phone gets stolen, they don't pay their mobile phone bill, so they can't receive text messages, they leave their YubiKey in an airport, how do you handle a lost token? Um, you, many sites offer some sort of downloadable backup codes. Unfortunately, most users don't actually download them. I, I don't know where my backup codes are. I'm sure I put them somewhere. <laughs> um, you could have a backup phone, right? So you've got a hard token, but if they lose it, you'll text them a code instead. Well, unfortunately, you've just kind of compromised the security of your, of your system because now an attacker can compromise either the primary token or the backup token. And so you've increased your attack surface at the, at the benefit of, of better usability. You can just throw up your hands and say, hey, if you get locked out, contact support and we'll get you back in. Unfortunately, that opens you up to social engineering attacks. You can just tell your users, if you lose your token, you're locked out forever, no account for you. Um, that's not very user friendly. If it looks like there aren't any good answers here, that's because there aren't any good answers here. This is a hard question and it's complicated and I don't have a great suggestion here other than make sure you think about this upfront and answer these questions explicitly so that you've made a conscious decision rather than being wishy-washy about it. F for example, um, if, you're, if your approach is if you, if you lose your token, you're locked out forever. If you make that decision consciously up front, you can communicate it to your users when they, when they enroll, right? And that's a much better user experience if you warn them at the very beginning, like, hey, if you lose your token, you're screwed, than if you tell them after the fact and they didn't know about it at the beginning. So my recommendations, save the best part to last so you could pay attention. Um, so I've broken this up into two different recommendations where I think the trade-offs differ. One is for sort of broadly facing, public facing systems. Think Instagram, Twitter, Dropbox, whatever. You're implementing a, a, a solution with you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of users um, and you know, free or very low cost. And one is for protecting internal systems, your, your SSH servers, your deployment pipeline, those sorts of things. For public facing systems, I think out of band communication is probably the best solution for a, for a broad market. Um, almost everyone will have a mobile phone at this point. If, you're, if you are at really broad scale or if you're, and or if you're deploying into developing nations, uh, take some time to test out what delivery looks like um, in, in countries with less developed infrastructure. SMS delivery can be complicated and may take some time, so it, you know, bears some testing. Um, a good soft token implementation, I really like Authy, will help with some of the usability problems around um, uh, Google Authenticator. Scanning a barcode with your phone on the screen is, is really not, not very good for non-sophisticated users. Um, but something like Authy will cost money over a free solution. Ideally, I think you should require MFA not just at login, but like at least on one or two of your most sensitive actions, you know, deleting something, adding new users, changing the password, something, you know, something uh, uh, dangerous. Not as much because that adds that much more protection to your users, but because that makes it, that, that gets you into the mindset of thinking about authentication as something that continues to happen over the lifespan of the application. And I think backup codes and a phone or email backup is, is probably the best solution for, for public facing. It's not great. Um, one big piece of advice though is don't allow your support staff or your support system to reset multi-factor auth. Social engineering attacks are really easy and that opens up your users to a whole host of problems that you, that you don't want. 
for internal systems, I think it, be, it behooves us to be a little more strict. And, and we have more control, right? We can, we can require staff to use the tools that we provide, uh, and we can check if they're doing it, and, and the cost structure is very different when you're just dealing with your staff. I think hard tokens are, are the best way to go for internal systems. Um, we used YubiKeys at Heroku, I love them. Um, absolutely think they're just spectacular. The cost is fairly low, down to about 20 bucks in bulk. There's a newer protocol called U2F, Universal Two-Factor, which is worth investigating. It's a little bit, probably a little bit harder to implement than sort of the old style YubiKey, but it has the advantage of not needing a different key for each service. It's universal, one key for all services. So if you can get U2F to work within the scope of what you're doing, uh, recommend it, it's pretty great. I recommend you try to do behavioral analysis from the very beginning, even if it's pretty simple, even if it's just, you know, location plus user agent plus action, something like that, something relatively simple. Um, again, this is a ratchet, right? It lets you start relatively simple and then push the envelope of how sophisticated you are on, on re-authing over time. And for internal systems, you, you have the added benefit of there being an existing sort of organizational structure. And so resist the temptation to have some sort of backup token. Require users to like, physically go to the security team and say, hi, you know me, give me a new token. Or if you're a distributed team, maybe a video chat with, a, with a, an ID card or something. Um, again, backup tokens, a, an attacker is going to see that you have some sort of backup system and is going to go after that because it's almost always weaker than the, than the hard token. So hopefully I've given you the information you need to go from feeling unsure about what to do about multi-factor auth to being super excited to get to implement multi-factor auth on your system. Thank you. <laughs>